Hi, my name is Chris Bloom, and I'm a developer here at Knapsack. And uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we're going to have a conversation with a guy who needs no introduction. Uh, the fact that you're all here, you probably already know who he is. Uh, this is Brad Frost. Uh, Brad, I want you to know that I'm here in my role pretty much because of you and everything that you've done. Um, and I'd like you to kind of introduce yourself uh, real quick and tell us a little bit about what you've done and we'll go through some other slides here at the, at the top. Uh, thanks, Chris, and, and thanks all. Thanks for having me. Thanks for hosting and everyone who's, who's joining. Thank you very much for, for your time and, and attention. It means a lot to me. Uh, I'm Brad Frost and I am a design system consultant and principal at, I uh, help run an agency called Big Medium where we work with organizations of all shapes and sizes on design system stuff. So kind of training, coaching, but also building stuff with uh, our, our clients in order to help them kind of establish and evolve their design system efforts. Amongst other things, just kind of helping teams operate at scale, unlock cross-disciplinary designer developer collaboration and help sort of get things done, especially at these sort of jumbo size organizations, uh, which I'm sure you're, you're That's familiar why we're with. talking to you today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so we've, we've kind of been at this for a long time along the way. I helped create uh, something called uh, atomic design, which is a methodology for thinking about user interface in this kind of interconnected hierarchical way. Uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's, that's been sort of a big part of, of my awesome. own journey, but what we, what we do day in and day out is like helping teams, yeah, establish and evolve design systems, think about what's next, adopting new technologies, things like doing a lot of like web component stuff, but also, you know, the, sort of more the, the code side of design systems in addition to the, the Figma side and sort of thinking, how do we help our, our clients and organizations think about tools like Knapsack and the, and the rest Very of that? Cool. Yep. Awesome. So that's me. Um, well, we're going to ask you some questions here in just a second, but we'd like to start by just letting you know um, we have some upcoming events for uh, Knapsack. We have these Design Systems Leadership Summits. We have one in San Francisco in April, April 18th, one in Seattle, one in Portland. Uh, feel free to, to join, sign up for that, get in contact with Lindsay here and our team. Uh, would love to have you. These have been awesome. And we get into a lot of nitty gritty about design systems and how it relates to uh, organizations and organizational success around that. Okay, I believe that's all we have here up at the top. I'm gonna skip the QA slide because we don't need it. And I'm gonna move to the full size so we can actually see you, Brad, uh, and, and see us talk. Um, and I'd like to ask you a couple of things. This conversation is ostensibly about systems of systems, okay? Like we all, know what a design system here is, and we kind of know why it's valuable. But as soon as teams figured out how to do design systems, they realized they needed them to do more. Um, how would you define a system of systems in this world? Yeah, it's, it's tricky. So there's the design system. If you draw a bubble around what a design system is, it is, there are a lot of sort of requisite parts of a design system, right? So some subsystems of a design system include a component library in both design and in code. That's kind of, you could think of that as its own sort of system. Design tokens as its own system or subsystem of a design uh, system. And all of this kind of hangs together to sort of form a, what we call a design system. But then sort of in the realm of an organization, right, that often has, you know, at least a handful, but often dozens, hundreds, or sometimes even thousands of pieces of software that they're developing and, and maintaining, you know, you're talking about all sorts of different layers and in, in systems that are a part of making all of this go. So as, as time has gone on, we kind of talk about this as, as an ecosystem, right? So this idea of here's a design system, but it's part of this kind of larger, almost user interface ecosystem and how all of the, the layers of this sometimes sophisticated layer cake uh, all hang together is really uh, like how this stuff tends to play out in large organizations, right? So we've kind of gone from 
design systems 101, which is like, here's reusable stuff like buttons and tabs and accordions mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the rest of it. And then here, go use them. And obviously that's a very sort of, you know, that's technically true, but there's a lot more to the story. And as, right. as we work with like a lot of different organizations with a lot of different needs, a lot of different technologies floating around, a lot of different brands, multi, you know, multiple brands, multiple uh, generations of a design language, uh, rebrands are always right around the corner. So sort of wow. like supporting a lot of different multitudes of things across a lot of different layers is what ends up sort of necessitating a little bit more of this kind of layered and more sophisticated nuanced ecosystem. You've got a couple of diagrams around this. I, I, you know, we're not, we don't need to get super into it, but I love how complex this is. I, I, I <laughs> we don't love the complexity, but it yeah. really helps visualize when we start talking about this, like how crazy this can get, right? Yeah. And we need to bring some sanity to it. It's, it's, it's important though, to note. like, I thank you for bringing it up is that I think that what we've found is that design systems and this whole ecosystem should only really be as complex as it needs to be. So the picture that I'm painting in this post, as well as in this like crazy diagram is kind of like the kitchen sink and mm -hmm. very, very often, uh, organ I don't think that we've ever worked with an organization that has every layer right. of this kitchen sink represented. So some places do have more than others, right? If you're sort of supporting multiple, you know, child brands or, or if you're supporting different things or you're wiring up uh, your design systems, form controls to react and angular and like right. other sort of things. There, there's a lot of opportunities to introduce these layers but a design system in this whole ecosystem should really only be as complex as it needs to be. Needs to be. Yeah. And it also, you can't, it, there's this idea that's Gaul's law is basically like a complex system can only grow out of a simpler system. You can't just like start <laughs> at this like, sort of very sort of sophisticated sink. thing, right? You're, you're going to fail in that respect. So it's, it's really only like whenever you find yourself sort of hitting the limits of your existing architecture and ecosystem that you want to start considering adding new things to the fold. We got some questions in the chat. Uh, if if y'all are in the Zoom right now, hit the chat, open the chat. There is a link directly to this. Um, uh, Joey just actually linked a whole bunch of these. Uh, go ahead and hop in here. I can see everybody moving inside the Figma, see their cursor, which is amazing. Love it. Um, and yeah, this really does a good job you know, if, if people come to us and they're like, what is systems of systems? This post describes it, right? It really does lay down all the considerations um, about, you know, what you need to think about here. And you've got actually something I found that makes something very complex a lot easier to understand. Now, you might be getting into this a little bit later, but I'd like to ask it right now. And that is your tokens um, theming. Uh, the way you describe bringing in right these these primitives um, for those that are are you know maybe new to the subject right tokens are just the smallest piece of our design system right when we describe a hex code color and we assign it to some variable um, Brad you've been able to kind of put this into a really usable hierarchy that I find really easy to talk to people about. Would you like to describe your three tiered token architecture? Yeah. I have it up on the screen. Here. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and maybe before getting into like the sort of three tiers, it's, mm -hmm. you know, you, you teed it up nicely. It's basically the design tokens are really, here are these sort of brand primitives where you're describing a design language, right? Here's our, our brand color palette. Here's our box, you know, box shadows, our border colors, our, our uh, border radius values, even things like animation and breakpoints and sort of like other things that make an interface go and th certain aspects of that tend to be themable, right? Especially as you're talking about uh, supporting different brands or sub brands, or if you're talking about the legacy design language versus the next gen or the rebrand right. design system, or you're supporting light mode and dark mode. So there's like a lot of usefulness 
in kind of establishing a really sound design token architecture in order to support all of these things. And even for what it's worth, when we work with organizations that even only are technically currently only supporting one brand or they're trying to even like unify things, sometimes there's a bunch of acquisitions and they're all kind of coming under one roof. Right. The idea is that you, you kind of want to always create a design token architecture in such a way that anticipates the rebrand that is inevitably yes. around the corner. And that's always. That is always, always the truth. Like a hundred percent of the time mm -hmm. they're like, by the way, everybody just letting you know, we, we've got a <laughs> rebrand around the corner and we're like, no way. That's amazing. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so, so how do you, and if you wouldn't mind kind of keeping that up just because I yeah, do here, think let me pull that back it's, up. it's helpful. Uh, and I'll apologize right now. I have a color HDR thing going on, so it's going to look a little <laughs> washed out on my screen. I apologize. It's okay. It's okay. But yeah, we can, I'll also just kind of share the the links too in the, uh, in the, the chat, which could be helpful for people to reference too. But, um, but yeah, the, the idea, what we found to be successful. And again, this is proven out with our work, uh, with many, many, many different organizations, organizations like Marriott that has like a whole portfolio of brands or Condé Nast that also has a portfolio of publications with wildly distinct visual languages, right? Brands like uh, NASDAQ is sort of working, you know, rolling out new generations of their, of their design language and stuff like that. Uh, Pfizer, who has over 300 consumer facing brands. So whenever oh we're working with organizations like this that need to support a lot of variability in the sort of aesthetic output, we need to sort of establish a sound token architecture. And so where we've landed is this kind of three tier token system. And this diagram here is sort of describing here's Starbucks green and at the sort of we, what we call this the sort of first tier, right? Tier one is really your sort of definitions, right? You're just describing Starbucks green is this hex value, right? This is where you tend to see things like color ramps and stuff like that. Whenever you see a lot of design system stuff, it's like, here's our gradient of yellow and orange and blue and so on and so forth. And this is, you're basically just describing the raw ingredients mm -hmm. that go into making a user interface but you're not applying any sort of semantic value or sort of saying how Starbucks green is going to be used. So it's at the second tier where you're basically saying, here are the specific user interface applications of a color, right? Yep. This is where we leave hex values behind, right? Yeah, yeah, and we start mapping Starbucks green to, right? color brand, you know, so, so you could kind of like start seeing this, this nomenclature started to play out like theme, color, background, brand. And that might be used for maybe like a, a branded like newsletter sign up area on their homepage, right? It's like, it's like a big background, big splashy Starbucks green background with, with text sitting over it and the newsletter sign up form over it. But it also could be used for maybe the button, uh, the primary background of a button, so on and so forth. And then you could do the same for, for content, right? Text and icons and stuff like that, right? So if you wanted branded Starbucks branded headings and things like that, you could have that as well as for things like, you know, a utility success color, right? Maybe mm -hmm. you want that to be branded if your brand is, is conducive for, you know, whatever red for error, green for, for uh, success and so on. And then at the third tier is where we're starting to map those values onto specific components and but one sort of word of caution on this one it's like you basically don't want a whole lot of component specific tokens because then yeah. when you end up what you end up doing is having to manage thousands upon thousands of tokens and anytime you add a new component you're having to add new tokens what what you really want to do is really lean on this sort of second tier to do the overwhelming heavy lifting. So it's like kind of just matching for per brand, per theme, tier one to tier two, and that gets you 90% down the road. But then certain components like buttons are always, uh, they're always a gnarly one, a hard one. 
Mm -hmm. they require sort of some special consideration, right? They're heavily branded. They might be sort of used a bit differently uh, across brands, across different themes. And so we tend to sort of have that sort of tier three there for sort of special use cases. So, now, but there's... this architecture, the broad strokes of it has like proven to play out really, really well uh, across different organizations for all sorts of different use cases. So it's like, we feel really confident and strong in this general architecture. The names tend to shift around a little bit, just sort of based on the nomenclature and the language that is in use at these specific organization. I, there but was the actually a question of sort of like, Hey, you're, you're tying this to BG color. Why not? primary and secondary and i i think that's yeah. really yeah yeah, yeah. it's yep. just as you know you could probably fit that in just fine right in, yep. in that second tier yeah um there is a question really quick for you that is kind of nitty-gritty do you find yourself uh using things like SAS for this or have you mainly moved to css variables and that you know web technology yeah, C css variables yeah. That pretty much across the board now but that said we always sort of plug in with our clients ecosystems and, and yep. what sort of technologies and tools that they have in place. So we're, we're kind of chameleons. And so we get to work with all sorts of different technologies and stuff. And so a lot of times they do, they are still on SAS and, and that's, it's perfectly fine, but CSS yep. custom properties are really powerful in that they're like live in the browser. So you can sort of swap themes out and they just sort of, magically work there's no like build runtime yeah like that but it's also uh an important way of delivering this kind of multi-branded uh sort of design system experience to uh web components which are sort of another core web technology that works really well with css custom properties so you you mentioned web components um and we already have some questions around do you have recommendations here i think a lot of folks want that ubiquity of web components, right? Write it in web components, put it into any framework, yeah. theoretically. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we were promised uh, the holy grail of, of components. Do you have some experience with, with web components that you want to share and, you know, stacks and tech that you might like? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we sure do. And, and so we've helped, <laughs> we've helped organizations like, like NASDAQ, like Caterpillar, um, like Pfizer, uh, sort of all build these web component based design systems. And we've been working with this technology, which has been in is like a slow birth over the course of a decade, really, like all the way back in 2011 <laughs> is when it started, which is wild. But wild. so, but it's really around sort of whenever like 2019 is whenever we started working with them. And in that time from 2019 to present day, just leaps and bounds in terms of like kind of maturity and stability. There's still rough edges. There are web standards. So like web standards tend to, you know, move a little slower than, than just like, Oh, React. we just kicked out. <laughs> yeah. We just kicked out an, another major version of, of this JavaScript library, which kind of moves a little bit, bit faster, but the basic crux of web components is, is now sort of in place and is stable. And it's really powerful. So, so there's a lot of benefits to web components. One, as I mentioned, they're part of the web platform. So it's, you're not sort of getting swept up in the, the sort of JavaScript framework zeitgeist and what, what is the new hotness today, next year is suddenly long in the tooth and oh, you look like an <laughs> idiot for, for biting down on it. Uh, so you kind of are able to get out of that kind of framework churn and a lot of that sort of you know, third party sort of specific stuff that just kind of tends to be very, it's, it's fashion for what it's, for what it's worth. Yeah. So it's like, this is kind of saying there's web stuff and there is now a native vehicle for delivering consumable UI components to really any technology stack, right? So whether you're talking about a React application, whether you're talking about an Angular application, a Vue application, a Drupal site, a WordPress site, site core site like it, it doesn't matter right because it's part of the web it's able to travel to all of these places and when we talk mm -hmm. about what a design system is trying to deliver we're trying to deliver this consistent cohesive experience to the users right so as they traverse across our product portfolio or different pieces of a product that are, might be built using different things 
they're able to get that sort of cohesive and consistent experience, which is a good thing, right? Historically, before the world of web components, we kind of had to build the React version of the library and then build a, a, a sibling Angular version. The Twig build... version, the yeah, Angular version. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot to do. So we now have this, this idea of, of being able to, to deliver this consistency and cohesion. I mean, that, that is such a core problem that one of the things that Knapsack was actually founded on was being able to show your components in a lot of different technologies. We call them renderers, but the teams that just have web components, they just have one renderer. They just have web components, right? Yeah. But we do have a number that have the React version and the PHP version and the mustache version or whatever, right? Sure. And sometimes, you know, that's what you got to work with, you know, in yeah. that stack. Yeah. Yep. Um, we've got a question specifically, and this kind of does get more into like the tokens, uh, you know, discussion is, do you ever give the tier ones to your designers? Um, you know, what's kind of your rules around like who gets to use tier one and tier two? Yeah, that's a really great question. And it, I think that's a good instinct to sort of lean into that. Because a lot of times whenever you see those like big color ramps, right, you'll see 10 different flavors of yellow and you see 10 different flavors of, of red and pink and whatever. And if you were to just open the door to anybody and say, here's our colors, use them, you're going to have people going, oh, I, I want this light <laughs> yellow text on this white background. It is, you know, and that's not what we're doing. You know, with design systems, we're trying to make the, the right thing, the easy thing, right? So a lot of the times like that sort of tier one is really kind of reserved. It's like a, almost like a behind the curtains kind of mm -hmm. thing. It's like you, you need to have like sort of special privileges. So we don't normally publish those sort of tier one values to be okay. used by designers and developers. Instead, we're, we're saying use these things, right? Use the semantic layer because otherwise you're kind of making a mess you're you don't realize that sort of turnkey rebrand uh opportunity uh or the ability to support multiple themes if people are hard coding you know a light yellow in there and they're just kind of going rogue right so that said sometimes there are there are good reasons to do that and sometimes it's like in a kind of a controlled way and stuff like that but yet yeah, in general that sort of tier one layer is kind of a a back office okay. thing, uh, yeah. It's it's the wizard behind the the the, the curtain. <laughs> now this, this is so interesting because in the Q and A area and in the chat area, we have had multiple questions about what I'm about to ask, and it is actually something that you and I have already talked about, and that is the component tokens. This feels like a giant pain point that a lot of people feel, right? They end up with thousands of component tokens, and you've seen this, I've seen this. What is sort of your recommendations around either avoiding that scenario or um, just, you know, a good rubric for like when something becomes a component specific token? Yeah. Yeah. The, the general advice is, is like you really want to lean on that sort of semantic layer for nearly everything. And then it's only whenever you find yourself going, man, we really can't accomplish this or this. This specific mm -hmm. component has very sort of nuanced kind of variation across different brands or whatever that we're theming. Um, you know, so again, sort of buttons, links, but also kind of like um, component categories and stuff tend to fit in here too. So you might have like a, a form border color, for instance, that like might be applied to several different components, right? The text area, the select, the, the, the text input and so on. Uh, things like data tables and like highlight rows and sort of some like focus ring kind of stuff okay. tends to find its way in there. But you should be really looking at like at like I like to say it's like salts and fats. You know, use sparingly. Salts you and should, fats. You should only you should only kind of have this like you should be able to get your hands around it. It shouldn't be like every component or most components that have it. It's like you're you're talking about a handful at most. Um, and if you, whenever you find, you bump into that, the edges of the semantic layer, 
you should be really kind of conservative. You should you should feel bad <laughs> about adding yet another sort of component. Right. Tier three, okay. feel bad about using. Got yeah. it. All right. Well, it's 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 necessary. It's it really yes. is. But you just want to sort of keep keep it under under control. I think that's cool. the main thing. Awesome. Um, we have some hands raised. Uh, I'll, I'll try to get to you guys uh, here at the end uh, in kind of an open QA. So I haven't forgotten about you. I see the hands raised. We've got a lot of QA. We've got a lot of comments. Um, but I'm going to just ask you some other questions that I have uh, also because we got a lot of questions on this, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, when, uh, when you talk about these systems of systems, right, um, you've got a great post up of like all of the ways a design system has to be used, right? You talk about it evolving, you talk about different brands, you also talk about modes, light mode and dark mode, right? That mm -hmm. is kind of the one that everybody thinks about when they start thinking about theming, right? Theming a design system is like, oh, dark mode, obviously, right? Um, do you have kind of any tips or experiences that you'd like to share in the world of having a system that now needs to be dark or flip and, you know, something looks good on a light background, but doesn't look good on a dark. Like, how do you kind of approach that? Here we go. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and, and it's something, it, it all kind of comes back to this idea is like, even if you are, only supporting light mode and only one brand, it, it really is in your best interest to establish this very sort of thoughtful and robust sort of theming system kind of right out of the gate because it allows for easy addition of supporting dark mode and supporting other things whenever those things inevitably come. One thing that, and I just sort of shared this post that you have yep. up on the screen now, um, while a lot of places dark mode formally is a really <laughs> fascinating thing and i do a lot of workshops and when we work with organizations i always pick at it i'm like tell me about dark mode like whenever people are like we need to support dark, <laughs> mode. dark like mode. where is this coming from and a lot right. of times it's like it's it's usually this almost kind of a designer vibe versus any sort of like <laughs> customer like we, our customers are really clamoring for this stuff is like really really funny yeah that's Does a great... your product actually need dark mode yeah, yeah exactly. and there's and there's some like really good that, that particular post is is a really good uh, sort of primer on that but one thing if you go back over to my to my yeah. other posts one thing that you almost certainly will encounter in something that a hundred percent of the design systems we encounter are is this idea of kind of like what we call like knockout or inverted right which knockout. is okay. here's like light text sitting on a dark background yes. right so back to the starbucks green you have like a semantic token that's your like background brand and then sort of text that sits on top of that needs to pass you know accessibility sort of contrast you know, have adequate contrast it needs to be legible it needs to work and everything needs to look good, right? So very often there are things, even if you're not supporting proper dark mode, you're going to have components, mm -hmm. form controls, all your text, the stuff that sort of sits on a surface will likely need it. a footer is another great example. Oftentimes those, those tend to be dark and then you sort of have the stuff sitting on top of it that need to be sort of light. So the way that we sort of handle that is we'll sort of establish and manage kind of this, this sort of set of inverted or knockout tokens, but then also the individual components will often have kind of like a Boolean uh, sort of prop on them. That's basically like a knockout or inverted sort of switch almost. So it's like, you could kind of say, oh, this card sitting on a dark background flip on the the knockout switch and ah there we go it's okay you know, the, the appropriate tokens get applied and and it looks great awesome awesome all right that was i'm really really glad we got to that because that is just you know design systems everybody understands brands right and then you have to say well every one of those brands can now have these <laughs> yeah. modes right like dark yeah let alone you know uh condensed versus you know white space right and sure. try to give more room um you know there's a lot of talk around like should the same design system be used in the product and the marketing website right because you uh you've you like harvest right i like harvest yeah. and harvest you know has a very clear marketing site and then you go into the actual product of harvest 
And you can see, if you dig into the CSS parts, you can see they're using the same design system between both, right? And it's, mm -hmm. you know, might not be all the components, but it's definitely, obviously, some kind of styles and tokens that are, that are going on there. Yeah, and, and, and it, it, it absolutely is possible to support those things, but it is also important to really understand the differences between what is a marketing site doing versus a software as a service product or, or a web application, right? Very often the things that are uh, best practices for a marketing site, you know, sort of more white space, bigger text, you know, sort of breathy padding in between things, right? Your, your data tables are, are able to breathe a little bit are literally an anti-pattern for a, for a, a piece of software that like professionals are spending their days in, right? So to like, be productive in. Uh, done stuff where it's like scientists facing things to have a bunch of white space in your data tables is totally an anti-pattern they're like no we need to see that density so this again this sort of same concept the same sort of theming architecture allows teams to be able to support both using the same bones right because at the end of the day a data table is a data table Right at the end of the day, a button is a to button. Show data at, at the end well. of the day. Form controls yeah. are form controls. So there's, it's, you know, I, I think a really important concept is like when we're talking about sort of what can we truly share across an organization, or dare I say, even across a world, is like what is like the sort of shared semantics? What's the shared functionality? What's the shared accessible accessible experience and stuff like that? Right, it, it sort of talked about this with Chris on the design systems podcast not that long ago sort of talking about you know you go to a hardware store and you could buy a door and that door is usually white and it usually doesn't come with the hardware right and it's your prerogative to paint that door robin's egg blue versus bright pink versus brown or whatever or to sort of add hardware in there that is you know matte black or or brass or nickel or whatever <laughs> that does the door open and close right like that's the job of a door and that needs to happen regardless of what it looks like so what we're doing with this kind of system of systems and sort of creating a division between the sort of token system and the kind of component system is we're starting to separate out that sort of style from the sort of structure and the behavior and that's a really important separation that unlocks being able to share the stuff that met is should be shared without sort of hamstringing or or limiting this sort of aesthetic and, and more sort of creative uh doesn't that really models. get to the heart of systems of systems right when you're building right you want to build these highly reusable highly generic almost kind of you know gray label white label things and you leave it up to the specific brands with their modes to apply their Robin's egg blue paint onto the, you want to give them the doors, right? Yeah. The design system is yeah. the doors. Let okay. them put on the brass knobs, right? Right. Um, and you're not only just saying like, here, paint this whatever you want. You're also saying, it's like, you're applying Robin's egg blue to door surface color, right? It's like, you're sort of giving some like affordances and some like some guidance on like, here's how you thoughtfully apply color and, and typography and texture and all this stuff to user interface elements, right? And you're, you're sort of guiding the application of those raw ingredients, which I think is really cool. I got another question here uh, that is, uh, this is probably setting up for a lot of fights, uh, but I love it. And it is, do we keep component tokens in code? Or do we keep it in Figma? And in Figma, do we keep it in variables or token studio? For anybody that's been in this tokens space, there's kind of two approaches. Where do we store this stuff? What's what is the truth? Yeah, so so design tokens are represented sh should be represented in a tool like Figma and in code, right? So like that's that is the there should be exact one-to-one -one parity between those worlds, which is why sort of establishing this architecture sh should be a cross-disciplinary process, especially as this world of things like Figma variables are like, you know, it's still in beta and like, it's all the, it's, <laughs> it's sort later. of new. 
it's really fun to see designers kind of coming online to a lot of these these concepts and stuff that developers have been dealing with what like SaaS is now almost a couple decades old. So it's like developers have been wielding variables for a very, very, very long time, right? So the fact that this this kind of world that is quite um, familiar to developers is now being avail becoming available to designers, really, really awesome. And it is a really powerful opportunity to sort of really get those worlds closer together. And what we've seen already with some clients is, is like the designers are kind of kicking the tires and are like learning how to use things like Figma variables. And the developers are like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and so, so what we, what we help do is like help sort of facilitate is like, Hey, let's, let's all get together. Let's establish this. What is effectively a shared language and vocabulary that we're going to be using in design and in code. And this stuff needs to hang together. So tooling aside, this is a cross-disciplinary uh, uh, enterprise, right? This is something that that you should really lean into sort of bringing these different worlds together to establish this stuff, to have everyone sort of hitting it from different angles in order to arrive at sturdy language and sturdy architecture that both sort of design feels good about and code feels good about and developers you know, feel good about. You you said something when we talked earlier that design systems are people things, right? And I think this is a really, really good spot where like where it's stored and how we define it is very much a people thing, right? Where yeah. you, the team comes together and the team agrees, right? It is a people decision. It's an organizational decision. Yes. I love that. Um, um, but, but, but real quick, I, I know that there is some sort of flavor of, of specific tools and like what, what have we seen as far as like kind of token management. So it's like, as I was sort of saying, it's like there's these things need to be represented in design and in code. Figma variables, incredibly welcome addition uh, uh, to the, the landscape. Historically, we've had to rely on a, a plugin like Token Studio. Token Studio, I, I feel like it's like, they did a really great job for the, the landscape that they were operating in whenever the tool was kind of created. What we've seen with a number of different clients is that it kind of will botch uh, some stuff. And it's like, it's, it's hard. It lets you type in whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. And the, and the, the, the spirit, this, but the spirit is there. And I think that Very like much. what we're starting to see is as these tools are maturing, there is this sort of need for parity and immediately everyone goes to, well, how do we automate this? How do we make this sort of the same? Which I think is a good instinct. I think it's a, it's a desire I think we all share. But I think what we also have seen is people just kind of going all in on that at the expense of the sort of broader, like kind of human collaboration and, and, and communication. So irrespective of the tool, get those people together. But also, I do think that we're getting a lot closer, and I think even like Figma, th this coming week has has like an uh, an event where they're sort of finally going to be announcing like typography Whoa. tokens. And so, I, I, don't quote me on that, but I think that that's that's what they have sort of signaled uh, that they're hoping to do. Um, that is very cool. I didn't know. Yeah. That. So so it's like this stuff is going to get a little easier to sort of cross pollinate between the two, but ultimately. The workflow looks like this cross disciplinary process to sort of arrive at the, the language and the structure designers tend to own and sort of do the mapping and the definitions of that stuff in figma land let's say figma variables developers meanwhile sort of manage a json repository of yep. those values right? that sort of parity uh, version of that and then you use a tool, often style dictionary, uh, which is created by the, the team at Amazon, to, that basically takes that JSON and converts it into CSS custom properties, SAS variables, Flutter, iOS, Android, right. like really like any format you, you kind of need to support. You could basically and say, here's this kind of source of truth in code and let's convert it to all these different formats that we need to see. And I'll, I'll give a shout out here just because I wrote it uh, as over here in Knapsack, we also felt the same thing, right? We had to pull in from Token Studio, JSON, lots of JSON in their format. Yeah. 
And then we also take that and convert that into the, there's a proposed spec, there's a token spec out there. It's not perfect, but it handles most cases. And then we use that to bring it into our tokens engine, right? So you can manage this, you know, multiple uh, systems of systems inside a knapsack, but it's, it's a place that I've, I'm very, very intimate with of trying to juggle where does the source of truth live, right? Token Studio has been amazing. We pulled it in. We're able to get all of our assets generated, SaaS, CSS, VARs, like you mentioned, iOS, um, uh, Flutter, right? Um, but it is, it's definitely one of those things where like, as long as it's data, I think it's kind of like a big thing. As long as it becomes something that is data and that the team agrees on that it is stored somewhere that is the source of truth, we can turn that into whatever we want, right? But it's gotta be data. We didn't do that for a long time, right? We kept these things as like, I don't know, Photoshop files, right? Or it's a bunch of SAS VARs, right? Which isn't actually data. Um, and it's only in the last couple of years that we kind of decided that like, hey, maybe these things should be JSON, right? And as soon as they're JSON, they can be shared and whatever. So love that. Yeah. Yep. Um, do you have anything else you'd like to add on that? No, no, I think I think we, we covered it. It's, but it, I think like sort of zooming out a little bit from this particular thing, it's a, it's a great example of a pattern that we've seen. You know, I've been doing this full time and helping enterprises create design systems for effectively like 11 years now. The balance to strike, and this, this is in this moment in time, this is what we're talking about. It's like, oh, how do we, you know, synchronize these things? What's the tooling around it? That's always going to be a given, right? There's always going to be, here, here's the new rough edges or whatever. The challenge of design systems and, and technology just writ large is that you must operate using the available tools, technologies, and techniques that are available to us today, right? On April 10th, 2024, if you're building a web app, you're building, here's the options available to you. But with design systems, like what we're talking about is really sort of establishing a kind of a core kind of front end infrastructure layer. And that front end infrastructure layer involves a lot of like careful thought and careful consideration. So you simultaneously need to support the tools, technologies and techniques of the day, but you also simultaneously need to transcend them as well. Right. And that's, that's, I think the real art of doing this stuff and do and getting the balance right is like how do you sort of not over dial on screw it we're going all in on you know the css and js flavor of the month or whatever and then you end up getting burned three months later like we've like literally seen that play out with a client like over the course of <laughs> over the course of an engagement with them it's like they're like all excited about it and then it ended up getting like kind of sunsetted and they're like ah <laughs> which is <laughs> not good but then you also don't want it to sort of be on the other end of the spectrum where it's like that sort of theoretical purity gets in the way of actually sort of shipping and getting things out the door and getting the design system powering the real software that real human beings are using right now so it's like it really is this balancing act of sort of like balancing real sort of pragmatic in getting things done in this in this day and age while also being mindful about like how can what we're doing today right be relevant a year from now three years from now five years from now ten years from now right and and we're starting to see this i think with you know some of these design systems now have been around for a while i think that material has been around for, since like 2014 and it's like even as it's sort of morphed and changed its shape over time, it used to be like bright pinks, bright greens, and you know, aqua and <laughs> stuff like that. There's a lot less of that now, but the bones, the concepts and the principles and like the sort of the general components still sort of hold true. That's awesome. Well, we're at the time right now where we just want to take all questions. We have tons. We have dozens and dozens of questions. Uh, Sambath and Andrew, I see you have your hands raised in the chat. Can you drop your question over in the QA? And I'll try to make sure I'll put it at the top of the QA. I know you've been waiting a bit. Um, I want to, uh, Brad, if you're okay with it, I'd like to just hammer you with a lightning rapid lightning fire. Round. Let's do it. Lightning round. Let's, let's go. Let's, I love let's see it. what we got here. Love um, some lightning round. We've been able to answer probably a half a dozen questions that were already in the QA uh, of, you know, things that have come up uh, already in our, our in what we've talked about. Um, but 
what I'd like to ask you here, we've got a question from, uh, let's do this one. Could you talk about multi-dimension? How would you structure the tiers of your token tiers? By the way, I think your token tiers are going to become the next atomic design. The thing uh, everybody goes and looks at as, as a yeah. reference. I mean, we're, we're, and, we're... and that's not, you know, like holy. And I, I don't want to say like we invented that. Like that's where through our work we've landed. And it's been really, really great and wonderful yes. and validating to see other people go, hey, here's, here's this idea. It we no longer us. say heading h1 we like kind of split those out into <laughs> two separate concepts yeah so how would you structure the tiers okay when you're dealing with multiple brands and different modes this by the way this has come up in a number of different questions like people want to see that three tiers and they're like great i have five brands and two modes each we, what mm -hmm. what do yeah so a lot of the times you you can handle it a couple of different ways if your light mode and dark mode are like significantly different uh you can manage them as wholly separate themes so right now we're working with a cruise line and they have a light theme and a dark theme and they, they're sort of uh, two wholly separate token sets now what you can do is kind of establish like a universal or a shared kind of theme that is like you're kind of like managing that in one place so your border radius value it doesn't change from light mode to dark mode right so you could just like kind of handle the dark theme as like an override right so a lot of times that's kind of what you're doing with dark mode is often like here's this added thing so you would like load the core brand theme by default and then add on this dark mode theme that should only contain the exceptions to the okay. rules, right? Everything else will sort of stay constant. And that that ought to be limited to what effectively boils down to like a couple dozen component map, or not component mappings, token mappings at that sort of semantic layer where you're basically saying, instead of color, um, color foreground body, right? Or whatever default text, right? So it's just like, if it's a, white background with black text over top of it in the dark theme you're sort of switching those things around where you're basically saying you know color background default is now black and then color uh content default is now white right so you're just kind of like remapping those, those values so that that it tends to be what it looks like and so you can handle that as like a separate theme or as it kind of even within like one brand theme and you just kind of give it a little namespace that says a namespace dark, dark okay mode. yeah awesome all right thank you for that there is a i think an actual fist fight about web components happening yeah. in the chat right now uh and <laughs> i don't hurt don't hurt each other don't hurt your, don't hurt me don't hurt each other <laughs> no i did want to bring you in as like the web component guru who knows all mm. of the spec or anything I, i'm not i promise I not to yeah yeah um but I, there was a good question just kind of throw out, thrown out there that is sort of like shadow dom, yes or no? Yeah. Um, <laughs> talk to me about that. Yeah, it, there's there's a lot of, and and I think I I saw you know some good comments and stuff on just kind of the the some of the ex, the still lingering limitations of web components in general, and I think that those are I just want to sort of share that those you know, those concerns, those things are, are valid and Lord knows they're valid because that's the stuff that we, we struggle with. So just even something like you have a label web component, you have a text input component, uh, web component. And because of like the shadow Dom, those things, which semantically need to have a relationship to one another are effectively their own islands. Right. So, and that's, that's both a pro and a con of web components. One of the big things that we've heard for like years and years is it's like, oh, if we like install our new component library or we're sort of like bringing in these new styles, all of a sudden it's going to start clobbering uh, our existing legacy stuff, right? So you have these like collisions. So Shadow DOM is a good way of like they encapsulate, they're, they effectively like serve as like little uh islands or iframes almost uh like it like it just picture like a youtube video embedded in a blog post mm -hmm. for instance right you're doing that but with like your button when with your form controls and again that gives you some really great things like 
you put the blog, the button on the page, you don't worry about it knocking over the existing code and you don't worry about the existing code clobbering and, and getting its gunk on the, on the new shiny button. So that's a good thing. And so we've built web components uh, using Shadow DOM and that's, uh, that's kind of like how we've effectively been operating uh, with that. But that does come with like the limitations of in order to create, say, the relationships between the form controls, for instance, it's like you need to do things like element internals, which like th there's like this kind of added complexity that kind of comes with making it all work. And I, th I think that like the, the, the sort of big picture vision, like how I view this stuff is it's like, yes, there are shortcomings there are limitations, there are hard things, and there's hard things with literally every platform. But I do think that like, I tend to be, I'm from like the school of Jeffrey Zeldman web standards oh, and like, I think like betting, betting on the web and like as like a long-term platform, as a long-term medium, I think that this is like, this stuff is hard. Things like server-side rendering have been like a thing there's been some really great solutions and like even in our enterprise work is like we've helped teams like overcome this. We have web components working in Next.js and like all this other stuff. It, it's hard and like it has taken, you know, some time to sort of get it right. But we are now like in a better place than we were even last year. So my hope, and again, this kind of comes back to that balance between we simultaneously need to operate using the existing technologies or available technologies and tools and, and all of the stuff that are available to us today. But we also need to be making good long term decisions. And how I feel about this is that a lot of this stuff, while it is painful, a lot of it's like just kind of like new science in general. And that's what we've kind of seen is like teams kind of just getting their sea legs with it and trying to figure out like how best to do it. How do we contribute to a web component library? if we're building React stuff and stuff like that. But the long-term prospects of this stuff is it's like, oh yeah, those issues are going to continue to be addressed. Smart people are working on this stuff. The standards stuff, while it's a little slower moving, does indeed improve over time. And this stuff is actually getting a lot more nimble than it once was. So I, I tend to sort of like, it's like a, yes, this stuff is hard, but also everything is hard. <laughs> and if you sort of walk away from web component, like we've, we've had it just to, so it said, it's like, we had a client, we like spent close to a year building web component based library with them. There's some frustration around it. And, and they were just like, you know, we're, we're ready to move away from this. And then whenever we really started digging in there, with them, it was a lot less of a technical limitation and more about okay. the sort of like people and the kind of culture around it. And yeah. frankly, some some kind of like protectivist kind of jerkish behavior. That was actually the one of the questions. The, by the, the way, server the side rendering <laughs> stuff, we were able to yeah. we were able to sort of figure that stuff out with them and say, here, here's the solution. They all feel good about it and they move on with their day but it was more like the, you have a, a human being problem. <laughs> awesome. Um, I, and I promised this yesterday that we would get to this and someone asked this question, uh, Ben asked this question here at the end. And that is, uh, uh, I think Brad is leaning toward talking about this with longevity and interoperability, but can you share your perspective around thinking of system systems in relation to your writing about global, the global, the, global design system. And I'm going to share your article here really quick. Yeah. Talk to us about the global design system. Yeah. So, you know, as I sort of mentioned, and I'm sure a lot of us on this call have been, you know, in and around design systems for a while now. And if you've changed jobs uh, over the, you know, sometime over the last like number of years, uh, we, what we tend to see is it's like, oh, here's kind of the same situation. And I've, I've, I wrote this post, I've been sort of talking about this, where basically, as I go into organizations, if I were to work with any of your organizations, which please get in touch, I bet we are going to see badges, <laughs> form controls, buttons, alerts, <laughs> tool tips, 
et cetera, you know, tabs, accordions, like there's a couple dozen the of the usual guys, suspects, right? the usual suspects and all of us, right. Whether you're are a giant entertainment conglomerate versus a financial services company versus a nonprofit versus a startup versus a whatever tabs or tabs or tabs or tabs or tabs, right? A text field is a text field is a text field is a text field. It is not the thing that distinguishes you from your competitors. It is just a raw ingredient you need to establish in order to sort of get that sort of economies of scale. Right. So what we're at in the, if you scroll back up to that picture, here's where we're all at, right? Every one of us on this call, this picture. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, here's what we're doing yeah. within each of our organizations. And then whenever you sort of zoom out like this, this picture is what yep. we're all up against, right? It's like the exact same couple dozen components yep. again and again and again, and all of them, or I should say none of them have kind of like a formal stamp of approval they're not like a formal standard they are uh, operate we often operate within our spheres of influence and a lot of times at an organization it's like okay we have an organization-wide design system and that's as far as our influence goes right so my pitch for a global design system is it's like we should have a single place for these couple dozen components to free up our collective time and life energy to do far more fulfilling, worthwhile things than rebuild a freaking date picker for the 17th <laughs> time, right? Like that is not a good use of human beings time on earth like that. Like, so how do we collectively share this, but also like, how do we sort of create something that's not just like a sibling to material design or bootstrap or any right, of the, you know, right. what a tailwind UI. Another competing framework. Yeah. How do we have this? And like, we see this time and time again, it's like, what's the like official accessible accordions? Like I want to use that, right? What's like the, what are the components that aren't going to get me sued? Like, I think a lot of people want to be good citizens of the web and do things and build things in an accessible way. And it's like, boy, there's such an opportunity to just be like, here are those tabs. Here are those form controls that have the label and the inputs associated with one another. And what that would do, what having a global design system would do is free up all of our smart brains and hands to be able to work on the things that really are unique to your organization, right? And as well as kind of, still owning that sort of system of systems, right? Like the design token layer and sort of making sure that this all looks great, but building like custom components, spending more time with the people consuming these libraries. Like this is what we see time and again is like people, design system teams often head down building badges when what they should be doing is sort of having their, their head up looking at how are people using that badge right yeah. but we're all kind of collectively distracted with kind of building and maintaining this sort of same how we got components. we have two dozen components we got to get done by a deadline right yeah. we don't have time yeah exactly so so it's like how can we free up our time to sort of spend more time on the service right like design systems are a service organization so it's like how can we be helping you? Like, what could we be helping you with? I think that's re the real important work that really leads to success. The badge, all of that stuff's like incidental, right? Um, so the people who are reaching for MUI or reaching for like existing design systems, their instincts are exactly right. But what those existing systems do also is provide usually a default aesthetic which mm -hmm. is gross because then you end up having to sort of hack or customize. It's like, yes, you could theme within constraints, but you end up, what we tend to see for years and years is like bootstrap just getting demolished and hacked. Or overridden. And yeah, yeah, it's just gross and it's not, it's not good. You're fighting it, right? So it's like what we need is like that kind of just stripped down totally. The term is like headless and different sort of... Um, you know, sort of react specific flavors of mm -hmm. that kind of initiative are sort of underway. But again, how do we do this in such a way where WordPress sites and just regular right. old HTML websites, like going all the way back, like how can we 
sort of accomplish this and sort of just give people these answers so that we're able to do better things with our time and energy and talents. Awesome. Well, I want to be cognizant of your time. We're at the top of the hour right now. I want to thank you so, so, so much here. I'm gonna, let me stop sharing here. Um, thank you so much for, for making this and, you know, talking with us. I, there are, I didn't get to, I think half the questions and half the QA. Um, we are going to try to get an email out with all the links that have been presented here. Um, a lot of stuff from the chat. Uh, we've got some blogs and we've got some um, podcasts. We'll follow up on this information later on. Brad, again, thank you so much. Is there anything that you kind of want to leave us with here at the end as we bounce? Um, I'll, I'll leave it to you. Yeah. I, again, I, I think, you know, you're all at various, you know, at a point in your design system journey, whether you're sort of just getting started or you have like a super mature design system in place that you're sort of managing or evolving. And I just like want to say you're doing awesome wherever you're at. I know that there, these, this stuff is never done. And that's like a little bit of like a platitude that gets applied to design systems, but it is true. It's like, all you, all we can do is kind of keep making forward progress, celebrate your wins, recognize that this has so much more to do with, with just people and, and connecting people and arranging people and aligning people and, and doing that work requires a real sort of service oriented attitude. It requires curiosity. It requires empathy. It requires kindness. It requires all of the stuff that are very good human qualities. So really like lean in to that, like, because the opportunity is really here to sort of help bring people together and just focus on, again, while the tools and the technologies is like a big frothy churn all the time, just like really focus on that aspect of it because those qualities those human qualities are going to sort of help you <laughs> and, and lead to that those are ultimately the things that are going to lead you to success and then i think like the last thing that just just so it said like if you ever need help with any of this if you have questions about this if you want to argue about web components with me like feel free to <laughs> to uh, uh reach out to me my email is just brad at at bigmedium.com and you could like kind of check out if you if your organization needs help with whether it's token architecture or whatever helping stand up any of this stuff we're happy to help awesome thank you again that's brad at bigmedium.com get a hold of brad if you have any any questions uh i'm chris with knapsack over here we're here for all your design systems management needs give us a holler if you also uh want to take that route and thanks again everybody have a great day enjoy the rest of your day thank you all for having me take care Wow.